All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. It is fantastic to see so many folks out here tonight. Um, if you're looking for a seat, there's plenty of seats. Well, I was going to say plenty of seats up in the balcony, but we're running out up there too, which is a good, good problem to have. Um, but still seats up in the balcony if you need a place to sit. Um, my name is Sean Beckett. I'm a program coordinator for, for Burlington Geographic. Um, as, the, as the lights dim a little bit, I can still see your faces and your hands. Um, who is, for, for how many people is this your first Burlington Geographic event? Fantastic. And uh, how many folks have been to our events in the past? At least one of them. Anybody been to more than, more than two? More than three? All right. <laughs> Um, well, every, every, uh, every event that we have, I ask that question. It's wonderful to see so many new faces and familiar faces each time. Um, so, so welcome this evening. Uh, for those of you that are new to us, which is most of you, let me just do uh, di due diligence and, and explain who we are and what we're about and what we're doing. And I'll set up the evening and then turn it over for a, a really great program. Um, so Burlington Geographic is a project of the PLACE program. And PLACE stands for Place-Based Landscape Analysis and Community Engagement Program. And this is a project between UVM and Shelburne Farms that's worked all over the state for the last 15 years. And the mission of the PLACE program is simple. It's really to connect people to place and, and to build sustainable communities by, by growing relationships between people and the natural and cultural history of our communities that, that you know, make, make our towns and cities shine. And so that's what we're doing here with Burlington Geographic is, is getting to know our city and getting to know how we shape our landscape and how it, it shapes us. So um, over the last year, we, we've done several programs. And, and each time we do uh, another program, we find ourselves with more and more collaborators and sponsors. And we've really grown a wonderful cross-city collaboration um, of over 30 agencies and organizations and small businesses. And so it's, it's wonderful to see the whole community jumping, um, jumping at the bit to, to be part of this kind of place-making initiative. Um, so, in particular, we want to thank uh, RETN tonight, who's uh, filming. You can find all of our programs on our Burlington Geographic website, as well as the RETN website. So if you've missed any, which uh, I guess is most of you, you have uh, as much time as you want to, to check it out um, online at some, some other point. Um, also, thanks to the Burlington School District, Burlington Department of uh, Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront. Um, thanks to the Henry David Thoreau Foundation. Um, and thanks to Main Street Landing, as well as all of our other wonderful uh, collaborators. So uh, what we do here with Burlington Geographic is to try to figure out this city. And we do it by, by you know, each program, we, we take a little sliver, a little slice out of this landscape, and we look at it by itself, and then we try to figure out how that fits back into, into the big picture. And over the last year, we've, we've had several programs. Our first one started with the bottom of that, that layer cake, the, the, literally the ground beneath us. We looked at uh, Burlington's bedrock geology and how our, our bedrock has shaped the, the uh, trajectory of Burlington's development for centuries thereafter. From there, we looked at Burlington's urban wilds, our forested open spaces, our street trees, to see what our ecology has to tell us about ourselves. From there, we, we looked at our water and asked the question, what does Lake Champlain have to do with our faucet, and what's the path that our water takes, um, our storm water, our drinking water, our waste water, um, how does all this fit together here? From there, we looked into our soils and said, what are we growing here in Burlington? What is our food landscape? And, and what can our food landscape tell us about our, our ethnic heritage um, over the last several thousand years, but also our ethnic heritage today uh, and our ethnic identities in Burlington um, uh, in 2017, 2016? Um, from there, we asked the question, what happens when you flip a light switch around here? Where does that electricity come from? And how has that changed over the centuries? And then we looked into Burlington's fingerprint of uh, transportation infrastructure. How has Burlington come to be the place it is thanks to canals and trolleys and bike paths and bicycling and roadways and horse-powered paddle boats and all the different ways that we get from point A to point B? And then most recently, just last month, we looked at the wild things of Burlington, Burlington's wildlife, and we talked about moose and bears and otters and fisher and animals that we don't typically associate with Burlington, yet are found on the fringes of our city nevertheless. And we looked at what does a transportation corridor look like from the perspective of, of a small mammal? How does a coyote get from Red Rocks to Durway Island, or how does a fox get across North Avenue, right? So that brings us to this evening. And, uh, and at the PLACE program at Shelburne Farms, around this area when we're talking about this kind of layer cake approach to, to looking at the landscape, we often use this phrase, from bedrock to birds. 
And so even though this is somewhat unintentional, it's very, it's very um, serendipitous that we started our programming this year with geology and we finish it um, uh, symbolically with birds. There's plenty of other slices that we could look into and we intend to next year, but uh, for the sake of this season, it's, it's uh, very poetic that we started with bedrock, we're ending with birds, um, and so um, we have a wonderful program tonight. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Walter Pullman, who is the director of the PLACE program, faculty at UVM, and actually teaches a perennial uh, retreat up at Shelburne Farms called Bedrock to Birds. So maybe there's no one better to kick off our evening on, on birds than Walter. And, and Walter will tell us about the birds that we see every day just along the street outside of our window and look into our, our common residents and neighbors and see what's going on with them, particularly right now, this time of year. Then Walter will pass the baton to Alan Strong, perhaps Burlington's um, most uh, premier ornithologist and birder and, uh, and associate dean up at the Rubenstein School. And he'll take us on a tour of the Burlington bike path from the perspective of a bird, or at least a birder. Um, and then Alan will pass the, the baton to Trisha O'Kane, who is reinventing what birds can tell us. Um, and she has put together a wonderful program that um, I promise will inspire you, that connects UVM students to students from Hunt Middle School, from Flynn Elementary School. And uh, we figure out how do we, uh, what can birds tell us about our own cultural identity and how can we use birding to solve problems of environmental justice and social justice and apathy and these sorts of things. Um, so um, I look forward to, to that and you should too. And then finally, we will put the geographic into Burlington Geographic. And, um, and we are really fortunate to have Dave Honeschau and his uh, UVM community mapping class here with us to present. Um, you, you've seen these maps along the, the fringe of the, uh, of the, the auditorium here. Uh, we'll have the chance to explore these wonderful uh, presentations of creative cartography. And, and these maps are, are truly um, amazing, looking into the life and lifestyle and arts and humanities and natural history and cultural history of this city. And, and I promise that each one of these maps will teach you something about Burlington or help you see Burlington in a way that maybe you've never seen before. So that's what we have uh, on tap this evening. Um, each one of our, uh, so Walter, Alan, and Trish will each kind of share with us about a 20 minute vignette or so and then we'll, we'll save the latter uh, portion of the program to be able to explore these, these wonderful maps. So that's, that's kind of what we have in store this evening. So one, one pitch that I'll make before I turn things over to Walter is that um, we like to pair our evening programs with, um, with a, uh, a partnered field walk, kind of like a nice wine and cheese, right? Well, our cheese is happening Sunday morning, and feel free to join us. The best way to learn about Burlington's birds is to meet them for yourself. And so we're gonna go to um, uh, Ethan Allen Park, not Ethan Allen Homestead, the one with the tower. Um, Sunday morning, wonderful Mother's Day activity. Uh, join us at 7.30 and we'll, uh, we'll spend a couple hours um, going through this uh, premier urban wild and looking uh, for Burlington's feathered friends. So join us. There's a sign-up sheet that either exists somewhere in the back or will by the time this program's over and feel free to sign up or just show up. Um, so I hope you can make it for that. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Walter Pullman. Good evening, everybody. I'm so pleased to see you all here tonight, and a special welcome to all the students that are here, and teachers, and all the residents, of course. Uh, but again, yeah, definitely come out for this. This is, this is where it's happening outside. We're gonna give you kind of a preview of the weekend's events, and there's many opportunities. Um, and really, you know, it's, as Sean mentioned, really, this whole program is about a celebration of place. And the celebratory events just keep coming, and they're really happening in the natural world all the time. And uh, I, I just want to raise a hand. Who's a, an April or a May baby in this group? All right. Not many. Wait a minute. That's it? Wait. Are you kidding? None of you are April or May? I guess we're way up there. Well, there's a few of us. I am definitely an April baby. And uh, this is... Uh, it's a special time to celebrate. In fact, whenever my birthday comes around, I try to see the number of bird species that I am years old that year. <laughs> it started when I was 30, five years ago, and, and I've been keeping it up. <laughs> no, oh my God, that was 26 years ago, and believe me, it's getting harder and harder and harder to do. I used to try to do it all in, in one day, but that became impossible quickly. I'll, I'll talk more about it. It's, it's pretty much expanded to a month now, the month of April. But as you can see, it's still, 
it's still something of a challenge, but uh, we want to actually kind of lay the groundwork um, for uh, you to explore Burlington. Really, this weekend and the weeks ahead, it's just a terrific time. And so this is going to be almost like a, uh, a landscape guide to it, now that we've been studying everything from the bedrock all the way up for the arrival of birds here on May 11th. New birds are arriving every day. And uh, here is actually a, um, a uh, <clears throat> I was trying to find a good listing. In fact, this is available up here if you're interested. It's kind of a guide to the week by week phenology, or really the seasonal response, uh, birds, how they're responding to the, the seasonal change. And you can see actually here, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, uh, if you're a March baby, you wouldn't have a chance unless you, you know, you're still a teenager and seeing everything probably <laughs> arriving back. But uh, uh, when you get in your 50s, it's harder and harder for April 10th. But I, this year, I listen carefully because it's always kind of my birthday bird, the way that I look at it. We're going to try, we try to do a sound test. We're going to try to see it. Get ready to plug your ears if it doesn't come out right here. But let's see if, it, if you hear this bird. Now this is a, uh, not a bird that nests in Burlington, but it comes through in big numbers in April. Anybody know this one? Oh, I, Kinglet is indeed right, but this is the other one. Yeah, this is the, uh, the ruby crown Kinglet, and it's a, just my favorite little bird. Uh, it comes through right about my birthday, and uh, here is what it looks like. Oh, actually, before we get there. I teach uh, ecology, so that's just some graphs here. But this is actually off the uh, eBird website, which really shows the phenological spikes of observations of ruby crowned kinglets in Vermont. So you can pick out, they're really just seen during migration. And right around April 10th is when they peak. And so I always, that's my birthday, by the way, April 10th. And uh, so that's when I had to see 56 birds, or at least started seeing them before the end of the month. And, uh, and it is just a delightful little bird. Uh, and by the way, I have thanks to uh, Brian Pfeiffer, Alan Strong, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for a lot of these images tonight. Um, and uh, it is a tiny little bird with a powerful voice. If you heard that, to me it's like a jazz trumpeter. It gets kind of wound up and it goes doo -doo 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 at the end. And uh, I don't know if they're still singing now. Maybe they're up. Alan, I'm looking at Alan. I don't know if they're still singing now or they're already moved up to their nesting grounds. Still still singing, yeah. So, but next April, be ready for them. And uh, I didn't see, I didn't get to 56 this year, so next April I'm going to travel, I think. <laughs> Go on vacation somewhere too, but it's possible. All right, so Ruby Crown King, that I'm going to show you in my few minutes here just some of the focal bird species that I get excited about because really birds were what attracted me. When I was a teenager, I just got interested in them, and that took me into the world of ecology and natural history, and it led me all the way down to thinking about bedrock and what's the foundation of diversity. Uh, on the planet. And uh, so birds uh, just have a, I'm not an expert, but I'm passionate about them and I get excited about uh, seeing them. So I'm going to share some of my favorites today and some of my uh, favorite locations. Oh, I should mention here though that here's May. Things really kick into gear. Here we are in the second week of May. Uh, and uh, you can see, you know, there's all sorts of things, uh, uh, a lot of different warbler species coming through, uh, indigo buntings arriving, all sorts of uh, colorful things. And um, this is leading up to actually kind of, it's kind of, it's not quite Earth Day, but from a bird perspective, it is sort of like Earth Day. And that is International Migratory Bird Day 2017. And boy, this it just takes on special meaning. This, this is an international celebration of how birds are moving between hemispheres. And, uh, and uh, really, uh, it's, it's about thinking about them and their migratory pathways and what can we do as humans to try to ease them and welcome them. And so this happens to be this Saturday, this International Migratory Bird Day. So I'm in, we're encouraging you to think of that, take that into account. Um, and it's also uh, the global big day. This is a big deal. This weekend, this Saturday, is when people around the planet are paying attention to birds. So what my encouragement is, let's pay attention in Burlington specifically. And we're going to take you around to some hot spots that we think you ought to uh, think about visiting. 
uh, this weekend. So here we are, back to Burlington, and the spots we're going to highlight um, pretty much cover a bit of the geography. I actually heard that uh, golden, or sorry, ruby crown kinglet right down here on the border near the golf course that day on April 10th as I was working my way up to campus. Uh, but here's the geography of the areas we want to highlight. I'm going to start sort of with uh, East Burlington. You don't think about East Burlington much, but this is, uh, we're going to go to Centennial Woods and up to Intervale. Alan, in a minute, is going to take you on a bike ride from north to south along the shoreline, and uh, then uh, the students uh, from the north end are really going to be taking you to Ethan Allen Park and up to Durway Island. Okay, so let's start uh, right down here. And how many uh, UVM students are in the room here? All right, thanks for turning out. This is near and dear to our hearts is uh, our local natural area. What's this place? Centennial Woods, yes. Fantastic spot. I tell you, the, the number of times people leave the campus to go for some solitude down here and exploring nature, we're really grateful for this area. It's one of our larger forested patches in Burlington. It's partly in South Burlington. Um, and actually, this is one of the main ways in here. A lot of people go in right through here. But if you live down on Grove Street and down here near the Winooski River, there's also some other ways into this landscape. Lots of wetlands, magnificent pines and hemlocks. Um, beaver live in here. It's just a phenomenal place to be. And uh, so I wanted to, I went down there uh, the other morning and was just kind of seeing who was arriving back. And, uh, oh, before we get there, I wanted to mention, this is for my NR1 students who are here. I have to talk about edge effect, because right? they just took an exam on Monday. And it, <laughs> I won't put you on the spot, but I'll tell you, it's basically not all forest patches are created equal. If forest is near the edge, it functions differently than uh, a more interior forest, and that makes a difference to bird species. And because the things that happen near the edges increase sunlight, moisture goes down, temperature goes up, more wind, very importantly, more predators, some brought by humans, some uh, just taking advantage of the edge, and vegetation changes. And uh, that can make a big difference for bird species, and it doesn't really function as appropriate habitat. Cats, in particular, surrounding Centennial Woods play a big role in the ecology of Centennial Woods. Nevertheless, when you arrive at an edge in Vermont, you might be greeted this time of year. Has anybody encountered a yellow warbler in their yard or nearby? I haven't quite yet. I've put this up here. I didn't actually. Oh, you did. OK, excellent. You've heard them, yeah. Okay, well this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in our paraphrase sampling. These are, these are fun sheets here because yellow warbler on here is kind of goes sweet, sweet, sweeter than sweet. And you'll hear that singing over and over again, often in the hedgerows or along edges. They're probably our most commonly seen warbler and one of our most beautiful. So yellow warbler would be probably right there on the edge of Centennial Woods as you approach. Uh, one of my favorite all-time ones that I did see down there in the beaver wetland off Grove Street, right along the edge, was the chestnut-sided warbler. And Sean, if you're up there, uh, or Lily, let's hear that. On our paraphrase, this one says, please, 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 the meet you. Okay. It's a very welcoming bird as you probe through your head. Please, 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 the meet you. And sometimes it's not quite that emphatic, but the males really, when they're trying to attract a female, they really are stressing that meet you part right there at the end. So this is a chestnut sided warbler. And as my students, I talk about how when James Audubon was first uh, sort of exploring birds uh, from Europe in the late 1790s. This was the rarest warbler in New England, uh, we think, or at least one of the rarest ones, because where these birds thrive today is in sort of open, early successional habitat, often very edgy areas, unlike the habitat of the more continuous, mature forest that was here uh, when he was first arriving. Now it's quite a common bird, and particularly in disturbed areas. So that's the chestnut sided you might. Another bird that, uh, one of my favorites, certainly, of edges is the gray catbird. And uh, long distance migrant, I just absolutely love the uh, rufous underside of the tail. Sometimes you can spot this. And it's got a very, it's a mimic. It mimics all sorts of other birds. But every once in a while, there's a meow, meow in there. And you, and you can't confuse it for anything else as it's down there amongst the edge. 
I did want to think, as you go in the trails and you get deeper into the forest, that's where we start looking for more of the forest interior species. And ecologists have been studying this edge effect quite a bit. And the size of the patch you're in, this is some, some data here that's sort of consolidated, but which basically says the probability of occurrence of these species goes up dramatically as the patch or forest size gets bigger, as you get away from edges. And uh, that is true with oven bird, the one that goes teacher, 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 and the crescendoing sound, to scarlet tanager, eastern wood peewee, probably their last migrant to arrive. It's the one that has that plaintive pee-o-wee, pee. All summer you can be hearing that in Centennial Woods and the wood thrush and its eel they. So be thinking about patch size. That's really important uh, and why Centennial Woods is such a key part of habitat in Burlington. Oh, I did want to highlight, uh, Gordon is here tonight. He's a student in, the, in uh, NR1, uh, and he's also a, a member of Dave's mapping class, so you can ask him about Cooper's hawks and the fact that some have, there's a pair or maybe two that have been spotted nesting in the uh, Centennial Woods area. So that's an exciting thing to happen. He's quite a photographer, and he's captured them on film. Oh, I was going to read something. Oh, I... I, I can go on and on, so I'm going to speed up, but I am going to read this one thing because as I was looking at these, I went to the All About Birds website that Cornell has. If you haven't been there, visit, and their cool facts are kind of bulleted. Here's a cool fact I really liked about Cooper's Hawk. Life is tricky for male Cooper Hawk, Cooper's Hawks. As in most hawks, males are significantly smaller than their mates. The danger is that females Cooper's Hawks specialize in eating medium-sized birds. Males tend to be submissive to females and to listen out for reassuring call notes the females make when they're ready to be approached. Males build the nest, then provide nearly all the food to the females and the young over the next 90 days before the young fledge. The life of birds. So, Cooper's hawks, the big ones are the females. All right, I'm gonna wrap up by taking you down to really the spot I just love to go, and, and maybe you hike there yourselves or ski there in the winter. Uh, and that is the, the Intervale. What, what we are so blessed from a food perspective, but also from a wildlife perspective uh, and a recreation perspective when it comes to the Intervale. Of course, all the incubator farms here, but the natural areas. Um, this is called Mackenzie Park, is that right? I mean, I think that's right, yeah. And then, of course, the whole Ethan Allen, Home, Ethan Allen Homestead property is just, that's where I would go on, uh, to, on Saturday if I were... Uh, able to uh, to look for birds, just a fantastic place. So let me take you um, down into the Intervale uh, with a few focal bird species. Uh, one of them is is one of my favorites, a year-round residence. I'm sure people uh, recognize tufted titmouse at your bird feeders. It's it's really if I had to pick one of my favorite birds, uh, tufted titmouse is right up there. But you know what I, I what I learned though is that if you're an old-time Vermonter, this would have been a bird you would never see. In fact, it wasn't until 1976 when the first nesting record occurred, confirmed nesting record of tufted titmice in Vermont. So similar to Northern Cardinal, they were slowly expanding their way northward, maybe climate change related, and uh, now they're a mainstay and they stay year round. But they're fascinating to observe, both at the feeder and uh, in the woods especially. Can you click the sound of that, because this is what I've been hearing all week. And the Peter, Peter, Peter of the tufted titmouse. Another one, another year-round resident uh, that I see regularly, pretty much everywhere around, but down in the Intervale when I was hiking amongst all the old snags and there is the white-breasted nuthatch. I think we have down, it just buried in the corner there, I think you may be able to click on the sound. It's the nasal yank, yank, yank of the, of the male. Also feeder birds, uh, together with chickadees and titmice are almost common winter flocking birds. Stick together for protection. And this is one that is just right. This is up there on my favorite because it has this beautiful, this bird wants to be heard. And it sits, uh, when it returns uh, from a long distance, and some of these birds come back to the same spot each year. Uh, 
same nesting area. This is great crested flycatcher singing boldly out with this reep, brrr. And uh, why don't you play it here a little bit? Be listening for this. This is a. Now, getting down near the water, once you're down, hiking down from Ethan Allen Homestead up off the bluff, down the fiddleheads are all unfurling into ostrich fern right now. Uh, this is a sound you might hear as you approach the river. This is what I've heard many times in the distance, because they're quite shy. If you hear that, it's very likely that you've flushed some wood ducks because the, the female wood duck goes wee, 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 as, they, as you kind of see them fluttering off and the male makes a different sound. But uh, we are, if we're not blessed by these, I don't know what we are. The, the wood ducks, just a phenomenal thing to see through a pair of binoculars. The male and the female, I love uh, the female's white eye ring and the, and the male's spectacular colors. Now, here's my, here's my quiz question of the night. The last four birds have something in common other than they inhabit the inner veil. Does anybody? know what it might be. They live in Burley. It has something to do with where they nest or how they nest. Yeah, they're all cavity nesters. They all uh, really depend on likely woodpeckers excavating cavities in de decaying trees. And uh, this is a little plug for this book right here. Uh, if you didn't enter the door prize yet, uh, this is... <laughs> I'm looking at my NR1 students, I have them buy this because this is just a phenomenal book uh, for studying the phenology, the unfolding seasons of Burlington and it's just got riches of information including that page on all the cavity nesters that would occur in this area. So you'll want to enter for the door prize here. You could win drawings at 8.30. And uh, so cavity nesters. A few others though, I'm going to mention that here, here's a cavity of a different kind. Those were all in trees. Anybody know what this is a cavity of you could find down at it, swallow, bank swallow is a good guess. There, there may be some in there, but that larger hole is bigger. It's probably about four inches. Let's play the sound here. It'll confirm your guess if you have it. Yeah, people are hearing it. It is indeed. It's not too loud here, but you hear that chatter. Whenever you're down in Intervale. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. There it is, belted kingfisher. Uh, it certainly arrives back earlier. Uh, this is one of the few birds where the female is actually more brightly colored than the male. We don't have many uh, on the planet. This is one of them. That rusty uh, belly band is what the female has. And just, just fascinating to think about there. These, uh, these are often four foot long tunnels that they excavate. They aim them slightly upward, maybe to keep from floodwaters from getting in there where they could be safe and dry. Uh, but fantastic birds, great birds to observe, uh, fishing, nesting, coming in and out of their, their cavities. Great thing to do when you're down at the Intervale. A couple of other cool nests that you might encounter when you're, when you're down there. Certainly the Bar Baltimore Oriole, the female, takes a week to make these exquisite pendulum nests. Takes a long time to make them, but they're uh, just tremendous works of art and safe for raising their young. And of course the brown creeper, which I, which I love. Play the sound of the brown creeper here. Some people think it says trees, trees, beautiful trees, that, but that high pitch, there's nothing you can really mistake it for. Look for the brown creeper. Here's, let me just read you. I'm almost going to pass over to Alan. I did want to read one more cool fact, and this is a little bit of uh, nice writing. The naturalist W.M. Taylor, writing in 1948, captured this species' energy and fragility in a memorable description. The brown creeper, as he hitches a ride along the bowl of, the tree, of a tree, looks like a fragment of detached bark that is defying the law of gravity by moving upward around the trunk. If you've ever seen this, they slowly are kind of like that. And as he flies off to another tree, he resembles a little dry brown leaf blown by the wind. So these are two more to look for. And, they, and the reason I mention this is they'll nest tucked up under the peeling bark of the silver maples down there. 
uh, in the Intervale. And of course, uh, I haven't been down there to see, but there likely are some big osprey nests as well, maybe new for this year or abandoned from last year. All right, this is hearkening uh, us towards the water. So at this point, I want to pass the, the remote over to Alan Strong, who's going to take us on a little journey that we're hoping that you might uh, recreate on your own very soon in Burlington. So let's welcome Alan. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming out tonight. So um, the uh, Burlington bike path, ru you know, roughly, I don't know, about uh, 10 miles from Oak Ledge Park all the way up to the, uh, the bike bridge over the Winooski River, really a fantastic place for, uh, for birding, just for uh, studying the, uh, the natural areas of, uh, of the Burlington area. Obviously, you know, on, on the one hand, you've got the lake out here, which provides habitat for a lot of water birds. And then along the, uh, along the bike path itself, lots of habitat for uh, migratory land birds. So uh, here might be a, uh, a typical birder moving along the bike path. We don't move all that fast. We have to stop a lot. <laughs> um, some of the birds that I'll be uh, showing you on this trip are aided by having a, a spotting scope, but certainly binoculars or a good camera is, uh, is all you really need to enjoy birds, uh, keeping your eyes and ears open. So what we're going to do is uh, move from south to north up the bike path and look at, um, I think, eight different spots where um, there's particularly good opportunities to, uh, to look for birds. So we'll start down here in the south at Oak Ledge Park. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, this is really kind of interesting. Another, another book that we have up here, um, Bird Watching in Vermont, which is by uh, Ted Murin and Brian Pfeiffer, a really awesome, uh, awesome book, and just gives a lot of information about where to bird as well as um, some information about the natural history of birds, some phenology um, information about the relative abundance. One of the things that's really cool about, um, in particular, what Ted discovered roughly 15 years ago is that we have kind of a mini migration of a lot of the species that you would be more commonly seeing over the Atlantic coming right through the Champlain Valley. And so the north-south orientation of Lake Champlain acts as a little migratory corridor. And so species, um, some of you may be familiar with the snow geese that you can see down at Dead Creek, but they come right down Lake Champlain, so you can see them from the Burlington waterfront as well. Um, Brant are relatively common migrants in October in Burlington, um, moving down the lake. And then these are some, uh, some scoters, black scoters, white-winged scoters, surf scoters, all move through Lake Champlain. Nobody really knew this until Ted started kind of sitting out on the lakeshore and observing this phenomenon. So really important movement of birds um, coming down Lake Champlain, an important flyway for a lot of, uh, a lot of different species. So our first stop here is Oak Ledge Park. And for those of you who've been there, you know you've got a nice little um, kind of wood lot in here. There's a really cool depiction of the, uh, the oak tree fort up there, which is a great way to get up in the, up in the trees and observe the warblers. Um, also some nice, uh, nice uh, little rocky ledge habitat as well here. But really a great place to observe migrants. So some of the same species that, uh, that Walt had mentioned. Here's our chestnut-sided warbler. Uh, here's the Baltimore Oriole, yellow-rumped warblers, which are one of the first, uh, first warblers that come back in Vermont. They're still moving through right now, so you can see them. A later migrant, the, uh, the Swainson's thrush. So a great place to just you know, stop in, kind of explore the little woodlots there and look for some of these, uh, some of these birds in the, uh, in the trees. Uh, we move north a little bit to, uh, to Blanchard Beach, and anywhere from Blanchard's Beach up kind of toward, uh, toward the, Blodgett, uh, the Blodgett facility, up towards the, uh, the St. John's Club, if any of you have been there, is really um, a great place to look out over the water and see a lot of these diving ducks. Um, and so Common Goldeneye, a relatively rare breeding bird in Vermont, but really common in winter, one of the most common wintering birds. 
Um, here's the long-tailed duck, a really showy bird with these nice uh, long tail feathers. Common loons, we don't yet have nesting on Lake Champlain, but they move through in migration in really big numbers. And if you want to spend a lot of time sort of oogling all of the, uh, of the golden eye out there, these are common golden eye. This one's a Barrow's golden eye, much rarer. If you look at about 1,000 golden eye, you'll probably find one Barrow's golden eye, so kind of a, a prize for birders. But a great place to, uh, to look for these birds right along the waterfront. Uh, moving a little further north along uh, Blodgett Beach in the Barge Canal, we've got some, you know, some nice kind of sandy habitat in here, which provides some great stopover habitat for shorebirds. So a lot of the sandpipers, we don't have that many nesting species in Vermont, but we've got a lot of species that stop over in migration. Um, so you can see things here like, the, uh, like both species of yellow legs, greater and lesser yellow legs, or the semi-palmated plover. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, out in Lake Champlain, kind of due west of Shelburne Point, we have a huge nesting colony of great blue herons and great egrets. And so this is a great place to see these birds moving back and forth. Sometimes you'll see them like this great blue with a stick in its bill going out to build a nest or just feeding like this great egret here. So it's a great opportunity to see these birds before they, uh, before they uh, head back out to the nesting colony. Burlington Waterfront is really an outstanding place to watch birds. And again, you've got this kind of nice mix of habitat, some kind of shrubby areas in here along the bike path. Um, you've also got the, uh, the water treatment facility, which um, interestingly provides some, uh, some warm water habitat for some species. And then obviously the, uh, the open water out here as well. Um, if you've been out to the, uh, the Coast Guard station or right down at the waterfront, there's usually a nice flock of mallards down there, often getting some uh, supplemental feeding from uh, passersby. Um, the breakwater oftentimes attracts a lot of interesting birds. This is a ruddy turnstone which comes through in migration and really interesting to see it out here um, right on that kind of rocky, um, artificially made coast. Again, that warm water over the sewage treatment flat uh, uh, brings in a lot of um, insects. So aerial insectivores like the tree swallow will use that area. And Burlington is really um, well populated with ornamental fruit trees. And so in winter, we see big flocks of cedar waxwings. And in this case, um, the little more northern cousin, the bohemian waxwing, come through in large numbers. So great to look for um, around the waterfront in winter. The other specialty of the Burlington waterfront is gulls. And you know, not that many people are really all excited about gulls, but you sort of say, well, we got seagulls in Vermont, right? One species, the seagull. Well, we've actually got a lot of diversity here. Um, the most common species we have is the ring-billed gull, and again, a huge nesting colony out on the, the Four Brothers Islands off of, um, off of Shelburne Point. Um, but we've also got a few of these herring gulls. They've just got the little red spot here on the bill as opposed to the ring, pink legs as opposed to yellow legs. Um, we've got a few nesting great blackback gulls, the biggest of the gulls that we have. Um, as opposed to having this grayish mantle. They're all black on the back. And then what birders really get fired up about are what we call the white-winged gulls. So you can see all of these species have these dark wing tips, but not on this one. So this is an Iceland gull. We also have another species called the Glaucus gull, which are rare Arctic nesting species that occasionally show up along the Burlington waterfront in winter. So something to keep your eyes open if you're, uh, if you're down there. Um, another species of nesting heron, uh, the black-crowned night heron actually is more, you're more likely to see it at dawn and dusk, but if you're down in the waterfront in the evening checking out the sunset, take a look at the pilings and you might end up seeing a, uh, a black-crowned night heron down there. So, starting to move north and uh, up, up the hill, if you have bike this, you know this is um, one of the more strenuous parts of the bike path. Um, north Beach is a great place to look for birds and uh, you know, one of the things Walter mentioned, the new arrival in Vermont, the tufted titmouse has come, kind of spread from the south. 
We've got a couple species in Vermont that are really interesting that have come f expanded from the north. And this is a merlin. It's kind of a medium-sized falcon. And they've expanded into Vermont, into the northeast, and have become a relatively common nesting bird, interestingly, in suburban areas. And so um, I actually, I live in South Burlington, but I've got one in my neighborhood. And uh, it's kind of fun to check out the kind of mass of feathers that end up collecting under their nest um, after the season's over. My neighbors always wonder what the heck I'm doing. But, um, but it, um, in North Beach, um, there's a lot of pines. This is a pine warbler, one of the more common nesting warbler species that we have um, in the lowlands here in the Champlain Valley. Pileated woodpecker is a relatively common uh, breeding bird at North Beach. And as you're going along the bike path, just as you're going over that entrance down to the beach itself, there's a nice little wetland there. And it's a great place to see things like the wood duck, um, black crowned night heron often show up in there. So keep your eyes open um, for these kind of hidden jewels of, uh, of little habitat diversity. Um, Rock Point, we had a little preview of some of the fascinating geology of, uh, of Burlington here. Um, this is the, uh, the, the famous uh, reverse uh, chronology thrust here. And one of the things that's been really fascinating about this over the last few years, it has attracted a nesting peregrine falcon. So we actually have nesting peregrine falcons in Burlington. Really, really neat. This species has come back dramatically since we've outlawed the use of DDT. And um, now you can actually see and hear them if you're, uh, if you're out at Rock Point. Um, also, uh, a great place to see some of these relatively common breeding birds, the American Red Start. Uh, this is the Eastern Wood Peewee. And I think Walt showed you the, uh, the gray cat bird before. All of these species nest out at, uh, out at Rock Point. So uh, moving along, getting to a couple of my, my really favorite spots. So Star Farm Beach, um, there's a really, really awesome overlook here where it's a great place to just sit and stare out over the lake. And one of the things that's, um, that's really kind of interesting is that um, in the early 1990s was when zebra mussels were introduced into Lake Champlain. And we you know, tend to think um, you know, sort of ecological disaster. And they certainly have changed the, the ecology of Lake Champlain. But everything is a food source for something else. And, um, and we've got these, now these wintering flocks of scop, two species of scop, the greater scop and the lesser scop. And they form these tremendous flocks. And off of that uh, Star Farm Beach is a great place to see these birds. This is a, this is a flock uh, that I, this is a picture that I took just a little bit further north in the lake. But um, on the Christmas bird count a couple years ago, I counted 7,428 scop off of Star Farm Beach. <laughs> I took it, I counted through a video camera. I didn't, I didn't actually go one by one. Um, but an amazing, amazing to see these birds out there and taking advantage of you know, what we think is kind of a disaster, but um, an important resource for them. One of the few species of nesting shorebirds that we have in Vermont is the spotted sandpiper. Um, as, as Walt mentioned, the belted kingfisher is a species in which the female is more brightly colored than the male. Um, the same thing here for the spotted sandpiper. In fact, the spotted sandpiper lays its eggs um, and walks away. The male does all the incubation and the parental care, and she'll lay a clutch of eggs for another male. And so um, all of the parental duties are left, uh, left to the male. And then another species of diving duck that's, a, again, a common wintering bird, but, um, but found nesting in, uh, in relatively small numbers is the, uh, the common merganser. And so this is a great place to see them as well. And then I think what I would say is my favorite place on the, uh, on the bike path is the, is the bike bridge over the Winooski River. I mean, really kind of a, a great place to just sit, um, watch, the, <laughs> watch the, the river go out, watch the birds fly by. Um, oftentimes you meet friends and neighbors when you're uh, sitting out there in the bird path, so it's a great place to socialize as well. Did I call it the bird path? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, my true sentiments. The, um, 
So uh, some, some really nice species out here. Another, another bird that we've had kind of colonizing from the south is the Carolina wren. And this stretch just south of the bike bridge is a great place to, uh, to see and hear Carolina wrens. Um, although the, the terns we have in Vermont don't nest right here, it's a great foraging area and oftentimes if you look out here over the water you'll see logs that have just uh, flowed out the Winooski River and are sitting out here and if you look on top of those logs you'll oftentimes see a tern sitting out there. It's also a great place for migrating shorebirds, so another uh, greater yellow legs here. This is a little least sandpiper. Both of them can be found in, uh, in spring or fall migration out in the Winooski, at the mouth of the Winooski. So a fantastic place and you know, certainly I, uh, I know we're talking about Burlington, but if you jump the bridge and go over to Colchester, it's, uh, Delta Park is just on the other side of the bridge, which is really uh, a really neat natural area as well. Um, this is the view from there. If you haven't seen it, it's spectacular. And um, one of the things that was really special about this this last fall when the lake, law, lake level was so low is we had this amazing uh, mud flat. And, you know, really interesting in terms of the uh, kind of the ecology out there, tremendous germination of plants out here as well. So, you know, species that hadn't been exposed to uh, that seed, seed bank that hadn't been exposed to, uh, to low water levels really started to take off. Um, but that scene was populated by just a lot of shorebirds out here, yellow legs and black-bellied plovers and dowagers. So, you know, really, um, really nice depending upon the, uh, the conditions. Also just a fantastic place to just go out and do some photography, enjoy the scenery. I mean, it really is a, it really is a jewel. Um, this, is a, this is just some, uh, some ice forming on some, on some shrubs. Obviously, it's a great place to, uh, to watch the sunset as well. And uh, if you're out there walking around, you never know who you might find out there. <laughs> so with that, I'll pass the, uh, pass the podium to uh, Trisha Kane in her class. Thanks very much. Come on up, kids. Okay, great. So it's Karen here too. Yeah, she is. Okay. So B, start the start the clock. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Trish O'Kane, and I teach at the University of Vermont a class called "Birding to Change the World." Uh, I started teaching this class in January of 2016. We're now in our third semester, and I teach it every semester. So here's what happens in this class. Every Monday, I meet with my college students, some of whom you see here at UVM, and we study birds. Then every Wednesday, we pile into vans as a group, and we drive to Flynn Elementary School, which is on the new north end. Um, and there we meet with an after-school nature club. Um, and you're going to see some slides of some of the activities that we do. But so there you can see Flynn Elementary, and from there we walk to Derway Island. So each of the student mentors that you see here on stage is paired with a child for the entire semester. And our wild flock of 16 college students and 25 children leave Flynn, and they walk, run, and even try to fly one mile north on the lakeshore path to our outdoor classroom at Derway Island. Um, we spend nearly two hours at Durway. There we watch birds, climb trees, build forts, and imagine new worlds like the Vertle and Swag Muffin City. We play with frogs, we carry around snakes, we drum on a rusty car with sticks, we follow fox tracks, we dissect fox poop with sticks, uh, we watch beavers slapping the water, and we imitate the call of the pileated woodpecker. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> our, our students at UVM have some unusual talents you might not be aware of. That's one of them. Afterwards, we all walk the mile back to Flynn Elementary School together. So this is a weekly two-mile birding um, and walking field trip. 
It's also a college pipeline program um, to draw more of Burlington's children into science and eventually to UVM as students, we hope. So our Flynn kids, we have kids here from Flynn Elementary and Hunt Middle School. The Flynn kids will go to Hunt Middle where we already have a second nature club um, and eventually we hope to have a club at Burlington High School and we want that club led by some of the kids that are up here now because by that time they'll be the experts. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank all of our kids at Flynn and Hunt and their parents for making this uh, community partnership possible. A very special thanks to Flynn Elementary School Principal Graham Clark and the after school staff, Mandy Harris, Carly Gunderson, and Nancy Margolin. So now we're going to hear from some of our Flynn explorers, then afterwards we'll hear from some of our Hunt Middle School explorers. Uh, from our Flynn, Flynn flock, we have first Jean-Baptiste Katanga from fifth grade, then Ivy Dorward from fifth grade will speak, then Colby Waite from fifth grade, then Isaac Coutrere from fourth grade, and Jay Heine Rob Robbie from fourth grade. So uh, JB, do you want to come up? Yeah, JB! I learned a lot about the red fox, and the red fox is very hard to find. Rarely we got to see it. Only, um, the only time we saw it was crossing the lake when it was frozen. The red fox is very hard to find. We tried to find it after, but we had no chance because the red fox has very good eyesight and good hearing. The way we got closer to find it was taking pictures of their waist and paw prints. The, the red fox family falls into the canidae like wolves and jackals. Owl. I learned a lot about the barred owl like they live in a large mature forest made up of both deciduous trees and evergreens, often near water and they need, and they nest in a tree cavity. Also, they love worms and hate when other birds intrude in their territory. bunch of woodpeckers. Oh yeah, and the fox. He's gone. I also saw a fox this afternoon yeah. at my yard. Oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, I learned how to tell a bunch of plants from each other, mm -hmm. like wild grapes. Mm -hmm. And I've also gone looking for turtles, mm -hmm. but turtles don't like to be found. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not in February or in April. Um, oh, yeah, we saw wood ducks and buffalo heads. That's what they're called, right? Yeah. They're very cute. They have really big heads. And I built a lot of forts. Yes, we built Yes. Climb trees. And fallen off of a few of the trees. Yeah. <laughs> Gotten our feet wet. A lot. <laughs> yep. And I don't know what to say. What about trees? Oh, yeah, I learned about trees. Okay. And, oh, my favorite part is building forts and looking at all the wildlife and plants. Yeah. 
So the one thing I really wanted to see that we don't really see much is a bald eel. And I kind of learned a little bit about it today. So I saw, I saw on the internet that they have a wing, wingspan between 7.4 feet and I'm pretty sure 9.9 .9 feet. <laughs> they weigh, same thing, 74 pounds up to 99 pounds. And the walk to Derway is we, we camp out in forts a lot. We bang on rusty cars. <laughs> um, and we see a lot of birds while we're going through it. So we see great blue herons, some woodpeckers, Yep, we saw a bald, e a bald eagle. <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, wait. Over birding, I learned a lot about the red-tailed hawk. It's a hawk, and it has a red tail. <laughs> and I fell in the lake. <laughs> we also climbed the rocks on Northgate Beach. Northgate Beach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here? Yeah. Okay. In the USA, in Vermont, in Burlington, and I have been walking in Derway Park, I have seen many woodpeckers. On our walks, we have seen woodpeckers like downies and pileated woodpeckers. Pileated woodpeckers are bigger, and downy woodpeckers hop when they walk on trees. Hop, hop, hop. A pileated woodpecker makes the sound. <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, Tell the story. <laughs> My name's Jay and I like blue jays. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you just heard from the Flynn Club. Now we have a second club that's run by Karen Overtubessing, a UVM graduate. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Karen Overtubessing, like Trish said, and I had the pleasure of taking Trish's birding to change the world class last spring in its uh, first semester that it was offered. Um, and uh, I graduated, and then I had the wonderful opportunity to um, one day a week go to Hunt Middle School and um, work with a fabulous group of sixth graders. And uh, we will go over to Ethan Allen, so the woods over there uh, right next door to C.P. Smith Elementary School and right across the road, um, there's Hunt Middle School too. So we have... Uh, Roslyn, Omari, and Robbie, and we're going to, we have some things for show and tell and a few stories. So, who wants to go first? No, you got it. No. Okay. So through our walks, we find many nature thing, things. And one of the most interesting thing is um, <laughs> I don't know if this is a fox fur. I'm thinking it's like fox tail fur. It's so soft. What else do you see? 
see many birds, obviously. Like what? It was one time like, a bunch of vultures just flew near us and it was kind of scary. That was a little creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else? We tried to find an owl. Mm -hmm. Never. So my grandparents said they fa they saw a snowy owl in the woods, or it was, it was a snowy owl, right? And we looked for it, but um, for many weeks, like three weeks, but we couldn't <laughs> we couldn't find it, no matter how hard we looked. We looked in all the places they said, but they must have left by the time we got there. So yeah. But we know owls are there. Yeah. Somewhere. Yes. Omari has some things to show you. Um, first, this is what uh, I found. It was the American chestnut, right? It was a, um, ow. it was a rare tree, right? And found in Vermont. And um, I found a few of them. And um, yeah. Um, what's the other one? Should I show? And then I found this partially, uh, this partial bird wing um, when we were hiking in winter. So yeah, that's really all I have to say. But. No. Okay. All right. So we have a couple of college mentors um, from that work with the Flynn kids, Emily Bogan and Ol Olivia Wolf, who'd like to tell a couple of stories about what we do with the kids. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. So I think one of the things that I learned this semester from the Flynn kids. Um, is that you really can't fake them out. <laughs> um, if you try and say like, oh, look at that, um, that doesn't always really grab their attention, but one time, which was actually brought up today when we saw the first wood duck of the season, um, we kind of, all the college mentors freaked out and we were like having a bird moment and we were like, oh my God, look at that, like look at the wood duck looking through our binoculars and that really got the kids excited about seeing the wood duck and then they got their binoculars up, um, which is kind of hard to do sometimes, but they were really excited about it, so that was one of my favorite moments, just to um, show that if you're really genuine about it, then the kids get excited too. Yeah. I'm Olivia, and um, I guess the most memorable moment with the kids and with birds was the time we saw a barred owl sitting um, in a tree outside, kind of outside of the school, and it was just napping in the sun, and we had to, and all the kids, um, maybe 10 kids, um, were looking up at it, and it opened its eyes. You're close enough um, to be able to see its eyes, and it just looked down at them, and they looked up at it, and everyone wanted all of the binoculars, but we only had a few pairs, and they were, you know, quietly arguing over them. <laughs> And, um, you know, one girl said to me, I want to take it home. And um, I was like, you can't do that. Um, but uh, it was just, um, I think it was shown up here earlier, just um, this incredible moment of the kids looking at the owl and the owl just looking at them. And it didn't really seem that bothered other than that it wanted to take a nap in the sun. So... So one little story to finish, I heard some of you laughing earlier, you saw a slide of um, uh, the face of our first lady on a blue jay's body, and we had an exercise um, where we wanted to get the kids to work with binoculars, and they weren't really using them very much, and so we thought, how we had our students, the students brainstormed, how can we get them interested in using binoculars, and make sure they're really looking through them, because sometimes the kids will say, oh yeah, I see that, it's a cardinal, but we don't know, are they really seeing it? So my students, very creative, came up with the idea of celebrities and, and people that the kids admire and love. And so they cut out heads out of magazines, the faces, and glued them on bird bodies. 
And then we had a, uh, a contest in the library. We had all the kids lined up and then 50 feet away, we had all the celebrity heads and they had to name the celebrity and name the bird. So that, that is why you saw our first lady, Michelle Obama, former first lady on a Blue Jays body. It was not disrespect, opposite, opposite. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, one other assignment we have in this class that's very special and I think it's a good way to end our presentation is um, a student last year said, Trish, why do we have to study the birds? Why can't we be the bird? And so I invented an assignment um, based on that idea of about being the bird and becoming the bird. So students, you know what this is about. One, two, three. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was really awesome. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. I just wanted to introduce my community mapping classes work, which is behind you around the wall here. We're gonna get out some snacks and some cider and invite everyone to stay and take a good, good look at these maps. There's some really wonderful stories in them and I'll just give you some context. Uh, my class was tasked with telling place-based stories about the city and they were allowed to use whatever platform they wanted. So there's GIS maps, there's hand-drawn maps, there's all kinds of different styles of maps going on. They were also allowed to choose their topic. So a lot of these are real like topics of from the heart and topics that they chose from some passion of their own. So uh, they range from uh, wildlife in the city, transportation across the city, architecture. Uh, mm, there's uh, I can't remember them all off the top of my head. Housing, affordable housing. There's some really great, and so one of the pieces of the assignment was that I wanted everybody to tell a story using actual geographic data as well as human experience, whether that was ideas or stories or experiences. So, um, so and that's why I invite you to really take a look because there's these little beautiful nuggets of stories in the maps. And talk to the students, you'll hear even more about it if you dive in. So please stay and, uh, and take a walk around. Dave, can I just mention one thing? Sure. Gonna be, we're going to have a drawing for the four different things here. You'll want this one, definitely. Uh, <laughs> and some great books. Uh, we'll do that at 8.30, okay? So that's in about oh, 15 yeah. minutes. Uh, after you have a chance to have some snacks, Shelburne Farms provides some nice cheese here. Cider, crackers, and lots of great geography to explore. Thank you.